All right, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to the book of Acts, and we are going to be in chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 this morning. I'll give you some time to turn there, and as you are turning, if you don't have a Bible, there are some in the, the uh, seat backs, and uh, you can grab one from there and take a look, or you could just look behind me over here. Uh, but I'm excited to be preaching through uh, the book of Acts because of mainly one thing, that it's going to cause us to uh, focus on the person and works of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I think that's the appropriate thing that we need to focus on and look at whenever we're walking through this book. Sure, there's stories about Peter and John and Paul and, you know, a, a lot of different people that are in the back of our minds. And we might want to think that it's really a book about the early church or it's really a book about um, the apostles or anything else like that. But in reality, it goes deeper than that. The reason why I say that is because I mean, even in my Bible, it says as the title of the book of Acts, it says the Acts of the Apostles. Well, that's what that book has been called. It's either been called the Acts of the Church or the Acts of the Apostles. But I believe the appropriate title is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because he is the one who is front and center. And we worship a triune God, but when we sit there and we look at each person of the triune God, uh, there's a lot of focus on the Father. There's surely a lot of focus on the Son. But what about the Holy Spirit? It seems that when today's church focuses on the Holy Spirit, it's heretical. And even at best, it's off a little bit. And I, I think that because, I, I think it's that way because we do not study the Holy Spirit enough. I think there is a neglect to know him. Um, I, I think a lot of it is just based off of what we've heard from other people rather than searching the scripture to teach us who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. And it would benefit us, or it is going to benefit us, to, to look at this book and learn about him. Uh, there are many reasons why uh, this book should be called the Holy Spirit, but the main one that I can think of is if you take a look at this book and you look at the, the acts or the actions in the book of Acts, I, I want you to notice that nothing starts until the Holy Spirit ascends down from heaven and inhabits the believers. So in other words, to put it plainly, there is no acts without the acts of the Holy Spirit. So that tells us where all the power comes from, all the knowledge. It tells us who's in charge. It tells us who's doing uh, everything behind the scenes and within uh, the church. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. That was John 15, 5. Well, the reason why I mentioned that is as we study through Acts, we will see that to be true. Uh, without him, the church can do nothing. So apart from Christ and the grace of sending his spirit, when we look at the apostles, they can do nothing without Christ. Um, apart from Christ and the spirit, the church can do nothing. So what does that mean? Well, it means apart from Christ and the spirit, we ourselves, we can do nothing. The theme of that uh, I've chosen for this book is life through the spirit because as we walk through we're going to see how the Holy Spirit could be is helpful to us how he leads us um, how he cares for us uh, it, it's a beautiful thing and as we study I, I think we're going to be challenged to grow in our knowledge and also our faith in the Holy Spirit as I said before we worship one God who is three persons father son and Holy Spirit, and it's very important for us to know him completely. So let's begin our journey by looking at verses 1 through 5. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, Appearing to them, or appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, 
For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Uh, beautiful text, awesome introduction, and I think it, it, it really helps us in uh, framing this book and, and what's about to happen. Uh, first, let me establish some biblical context, and then I'll get to the main point for today. First of all, I think it's important that we know who wrote this book. Uh, the author's name is Luke, and it's the same Luke who penned the gospel. And who was Luke? Well, Luke wasn't an apostle, but he was a great help to them. Uh, Luke was a Gentile. We can tell that by his name, his vocation. He was a physician. Uh, and a, a lot of scholars look at his writing. It's a lot more advanced as far as grammatically and, and intellectually than uh, a lot of the other writers. Uh, so he was a very smart man, and he really paid t pays attention to the details of things. If you're a detail-oriented person, I would recommend that you read the Gospel of Luke. You're probably going to enjoy that more than any, any other gospel because he goes into detail about different things that Jesus did and, and Jesus said. If you're, uh, if you're a dude and you just like action, well, read Mark because you're just going to hear Jesus went there, Jesus did this, Jesus did that. It's like an action movie. So, but if, if, if you like detail, Luke is going to be the book for you. Um, he was a co-worker of the gospel uh, to Paul. Uh, he, he was Paul's, uh, you know, great helper. And as being a co-worker to Paul, he was also a traveling, a traveling companion to Paul. So if, if we're going to say who is Luke and, and, and try to define him very quickly, that, that's who he was as a Christian, as a person and as a Christian. Now, for some reason, he thought it was important to write to Theophilus. And I tell you what, praise God that he did. Both books that he penned, Luke and the book of Acts, were to Theophilus. And as a result of his writing to Theophilus, we have an account of the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Christ. That's awesome. And then, that's just covering the book of Luke. But if we look at the book of Acts, we also have a detailed account of the sending, the receiving, and the work of the Spirit in the early church. So whoever Theophilus was, and a quick note on Theophilus, we don't know exactly who he was. As I was studying for this sermon, you look at scholars, and it's all over the place of who he could have been. Um, he could have been a man who was supporting uh, Paul's missionary journeys. And that's why Luke was writing back to him to tell him all these different accounts. He could have been... Uh, an unbeliever, and Luke was trying to convert him. He could have been a believer, but Luke was trying to give him more details so that he could understand the story of Christ better and also the work of the Holy Spirit. So there's all kind of things out there about who he could have been. But you know what? I do not think it's important. The only thing that's important is that we know that by the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Luke penned these two letters so that we could have them in our lap today and we can know Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and in glory. And then we could also know that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. So knowing who Theophilus is, it, it's a minor detail. You can go look yourself, and you're just going to see that it's all over the place. But Luke's last account in the gospel, this is what he wrote. This is Luke 24, verses 50 through 53. He said, and he led them out as far as Bethany. He's speaking about Jesus Christ here. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. Them are the disciples who were with him. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to uh, Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. So that's, that's where we leave off or where we left off in, uh, in the book of Luke. Luke, again, 24, verses 50 to 53. Now, when we turn to Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it's like Luke picks up where he left off. Luke's provide, or Luke provides testimony to the life and works of Christ. This is what he says in verses 1 through 3, and I'm going to summarize them. Number one, Christ did many miracles. And he taught many people. 
And there were those who saw that happen. What, that's what a testimony is. I, I testify to these things that they're true because either I was an eyewitness or I know somebody who saw them happen. So Luke documents what people saw, or saw Jesus do and what they heard him teach. So he did many miracles and he taught many people. Number two, he gave specific commands to the apostles. The apostles were set apart from the other disciples. They were the leaders of the church. And so for them, they got special or specific commands or instructions. Number three, he presented himself alive with many proofs, not for one day, not for two days, not for three days, for 40 days, for 40 days. Uh, that's at this, after his resurrection. And people were there to witness it and testify about it. And Luke wants to make sure that Theophilus knows this. It's a good thing for you to know this as well. Number four, he gave further instructions and lessons about the kingdom of God before he ascended into heaven. And then number five, he ascended into heaven. Or he sent, yeah, he ascended into heaven. Uh, th that's basically what he covers in those three verses. So really, he's just kind of recapping. It's kind of like when we come up here and we say, okay, this is a continuation of last week. And last week, this is what we taught you. This is what we preached on. And then now that we've left off from last week, we're going to start right here in this uh, section of teaching. That's what Luke is doing. Hey, this is what I, I told you. This is what happened already. Now, now that I've reminded you about that, now I'm going to kind of bring you back. And at the beginning of the book of Acts, he kind of goes back and forth with this telling of, of, of Jesus Christ and, and the, his ascension. But Luke's account reminds me a lot of John's testimony of Christ. Listen to this out of John chapter 1, verse 14. It's, the purpose is the same. This is what John said. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John's doing the same thing at the very beginning of his gospel. He's saying, you know, the word became flesh, uh, the, the promised Son of God, the promised Savior of God, rather. He became flesh. He dwelt among us. We, he, we ate with him. We lived with him. We followed him. We have actually seen his glory. We didn't just see a man, but we saw God in the flesh through the miracles that he did, through his teachings, through how he ministered to us. And he had a glory that was like none other. He had a glory like the Father, and he was full of grace and truth. The same purpose. Luke is establishing who Christ was. So when we look at these first three verses of this chapter, that's exactly what's happening. Luke is establishing his, his Christ's humility to take on flesh, his death for our sins, his power over death to uh, rise from the grave, and his exaltation to rule over his church. Essentially, it's, it's, it's the gospel that he is, is telling about in the, verse, the very first uh, three verses. Now that that is established, then Jesus, um, he, he talks about how Jesus tells his followers to do something very specific. And that's to wait. Verses four and five. I, I want to reread those for you. And while staying with them. He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. See, Luke reveals some of Jesus' instructions before he ascended into heaven. 
And I think the phrase that we need to really focus on is for them to, as he told them, for them to wait for the promise of the Father. You may ask yourself, what was the promise of the Father? The Father promised many things, including that a Savior would be born, the Savior would die, and he would rise again. But Jesus was specifically teaching about the helper who would come after he left. And scripture tells us that this promise that Jesus was speaking of was the pouring out of the Holy Spirit into God's people. Now, there's Old Testament promises of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, and there's also New Testament promises that Jesus gave during his lifetime. I'm going to give two Old Testament promises, and then I'm going to give you one New Testament promise, uh, just so that we can have some context here. The very first one that I'm going to give you is Isaiah 44, verses 3 through 4. Listen to this. For I will pour, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows from flowing streams. Now, listen to this other one, which is also quoted later. This is Joel 2, uh, verses 28 through 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Now, as I said, Jesus also promised to send the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. This is from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So this is the promise of the father that Jesus tells them to wait for. Finally, put yourself in their shoes. After all these years, or we can even just go back. We can go back to the very beginning in the garden when man sinned against God. After all these years, the promise of God to dwell in his people, to tabernacle in his people was upon them. It's an event that is, that can barely be compared to anything else other than the incarnation of Christ or the resurrection of Christ. After all those years, the baptism of John, as he mentions here in this verse, was a ceremonial washing of repentance from sin. It had no power other than the ceremony itself. And that's why there's a reference there from Jesus to the apostles. You are about to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And I can imagine when they heard those words, they're like, Okay, great, we're going to be dunked in water again. But this was a different type of baptism. The baptism of the Holy Spirit would be the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, indwelling the hearts of man. Permanently. 
That's huge. I, I don't have time to get into some of the heretical teachings about this baptism of the Holy Spirit now in today's sermon, because today's sermon is really an introduction into this book. We're going to have time later as we continue to walk through. But that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is, it, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is, it is God's dwelling inside of us. God doesn't dwell in the Ark of the Covenant anymore. He's, he's not in the Holy of Holies in the temple where only one man could go and, and, and interact with him and only once a year. And if he didn't do things correctly, he would, he would just die in, in the presence of God. What Jesus is saying here is life changing the, the biggest miracle that we could ever experience. And guess what? If you are in Christ, it has happened to us. The spirit, what Jesus is saying is that the spirit of God would baptize us in a sense where he would make us clean, but also make us a new creature. This would be a new era in the history of creation. This was and is still exciting news. Because there's only one more thing left to happen. Before everything, everything is made new. And that thing is Jesus returning. So this is an enormous event that Jesus is talking about. And he's, he's, he's telling the disciples, uh, all his disciples, the apostles and the disciples, I, I, this is what I want you to do. Don't leave Jerusalem. Stay here until the, you receive the promise of the Father. You know, waiting, waiting is one of the hardest things to do. And I don't know about you, but it always seems that God is saying to wait. How many of you have ever prayed a prayer and then immediately after you finish praying, it happened in your favor? Maybe that's happened. But I would bet that more than not, you are waiting on something that you're praying for. And, and the reason why you remember that thing when it happened is because you were like, wow, that happened real quick. I didn't expect that to happen that long or that quickly. The phrase that I get caught on here is the fact that Jesus, he, he, he tells them this wonderful news and then he says to wait. And so we come to the conclusion of the sermon well, I say conclusion, but this is the part where we get to talk about how it applies to us. And then God said to wait. Imagine this. You are a disciple of Christ. You got to see the miracles that he performed. You got to hear his teaching. You experience his glory. Glory like the, the only son of God. You've been following, you've been watching, you've been listening to him for over three years. While you are following him, you hear that he is a king. And so you, you're stuck in this earthly realm and you are expecting him to overthrow the Roman government. And, and as a result of that, you're going to rule with him as the new king. That's, what, that's why you began to follow him. But as you continue to see him, do the things that he does, and you begin to hear him, as you continue to hear him, 
he, he, your perspective of him is changing. You're tired of being oppressed. You know the promises of the Old Testament that God had given to the Israelites. You're fully expecting for God to do something because God has been silent all these years. And it looks promising because Jesus has gathered a big following. Things are changing for your people. Things are changing for your nation. But then your prospect king is captured, tortured, and killed. You lose all hope. You desert him, and then you also desert each other. All hope is lost. And then you begin to wonder, what did I just do for the last three and a half years following this man who said he was going to be the king of kings? But then something crazy happens. Your king who was dead, he returns from the grave. And then, as he returns from the grave and he spends time with you, he, everything starts to make sense and you finally understand that he was, not a merely, he was merely not an, an earthly king, but he was the king of kings, that he truly was God. You had been following God in the flesh around all this time. And after his resurrection, you, you follow him around for these 40 days. And then, it, it, it can't get much better than that, but then it does. He takes you to the area of Bethany. He's teaching you this final lesson. And then, mind you, they didn't have airplanes in this day. He just lifts up off the ground. And then he continues to just go into the air. Until he's hidden by the clouds. And before he leaves, well, first of all, before I get there, imagine how pumped up you would be at that moment in time. Talk about a man on a mission. As Christians sometimes say, you would be on fire for God, right? You would be ready to do anything and everything to preach the gospel, to share Christ with others, to heal people with miracles, to devote everything that you do and everything that you are to God. You would be sprinting to the next town, the next city, the next area just to do that. But before Jesus leaves, he says this, wait, wait. How difficult that must have been. We can't even wait for a home-cooked meal to be made nowadays. I'm guilty of that. If I get home and I'm hungry, I'm like, how, how long to dinner, babe? Oh, 45 minutes. Oh, man. They were ready to go. They were ready to change the world for Christ. And Jesus said, wait. We are a generation that expects results, outcomes quickly. And it's getting worse as time goes on. We want results now. We want change now. Why wait for tomorrow when we can have it all today? And I, I think we, we're coming to that conclusion. Number one, because that's the way society thinks. We, we, are, we are creatures who have realized we will not live forever. And so 
we have this, this thing within us, this goal within us, this drive within us to consume as much as we can here on earth, to enjoy as much as we can here on earth before we're not here any longer. Now, when the world thinks of that, there's no hope in what's here afterward. This is the best it's going to get for those who are not in Christ. So you can understand that. But for the Christian, it needs to be different. This is not the best it is going to get. We're not even home. But yet we, we, we do the same thing that the world does and we say, I need everything quickly because I do not have much time. When you look at what's going on here at the dawn of this new era in creation, Jesus tells his followers to wait. Why in the world would he tell them to wait? Well, to answer that question, the reason they had to wait was that they had to receive power from God to carry out his commands. As I said before in the beginning, there would be no acts of the apostles. There would be no acts of the church without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So here's the question that I think we all need to ask ourselves. Why does God command his people to wait? Well, number one, do not forget this. Especially while you're waiting on God. The reason why God commands his people to wait is because he can. He has you waiting so that you know that he alone is God. Not you. This is not based on your will. This is not based on your power. This is not based on your timetable. God says, I am God alone. There is no other like me. And that is a lesson that we have to learn and relearn daily. A sovereign and holy being waits on no one. And since we spend most of our time waiting, guess what we are? Well, guess what we are not? We are not sovereign and we are not holy like God is holy or like God is sovereign. Number two, why does God command his people to wait? Waiting prompts prayer. If you are a believer, if you are in Christ, and if you are going through trouble, if you're going through whatever it is, and you're having to wait, you should be on your knees praying to God to change you, to help you, to whatever it is. But that waiting period should have you relying more on God and less on yourself. And number three, waiting helps us to trust God and also to grow as Christians. Today, if you are in Christ, you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. You're not the same person you were before. You have help from above. You have so much help from God and his relationship with you is so intimate that he provides what you need for life and godliness. That is a, another promise from the father. If you realize that he dwells in you, if you realize that you have what you need for life and godliness, I think it's possible for you, for me, to praise God in our waiting. I think it's possible for us to forget about ourselves, forget about what we want here and now, and to say, God, you know better. And that's what many of us need 
to realize, and that's what we need to do. You know, in ministry, when I was a younger man, especially within the pastoral ministry, I wanted things quickly. I wanted results now. I wanted change now. I was just, you have that, that, that drive as a young man. And somewhere along the way, you, you just learn that you're, you're pushing against a brick wall. And a lot of your efforts, 75%, 90%, however you want to measure it, a lot of your efforts are just wasted because you're trying to drive change. You're trying to, to create results according to your timetable. And God is like, it's not going to happen, buddy. It's not going to happen the way you want it. It's not going to happen when you want it. And so over time, I would like to say that I, I learned this and I become wise to this. But no, it's just, like, it's just like when a dog gets trained. Over time, he's just tired of doing the same thing that gets him in trouble, so he just stops. He becomes trained by, by God in a sense. And so now, I don't mind the waiting. And I know that I'm aware that many times in ministry, those who I lead, they grow weary of my waiting. It, it may seem that it takes a long time to do something. Listen, there is a time to wait, and there is a time to go. Both exist in our life. What I want to tell you is don't wait when you're supposed to go and don't go when you're supposed to wait. See, the reason why I say this is because this sermon is, a, it's, it may seem like it's about waiting for things. And for many of you, I think you would say, hallelujah, praise the Lord on that. I'm going to wait on this decision to do something. Why? Because waiting is sometimes, it seems like the easier thing to do, but it's only easy when you know that you're supposed to be doing something and you're not doing it, so you're just like, I'm going to wait until I really start doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Like serving the Lord or joining the church or helping somebody in need or or reaching out to somebody or, or being the helpmate that God has created you to be, it's like, oh, I'm going to wait on that, that, that stuff right there. Obviously, are repenting from your sin. Obviously, you shouldn't wait on things like that. You're making a mockery of God's word when you say, oh, I'm going to wait on things that are really obvious that I should be doing already. But then the things that you shouldn't be doing, it's a different story. You're ready to go. The things that we shouldn't be walking in, the things that we shouldn't be watching, the things that we shouldn't be reading, the things that, wh whatever it is. The things that we shouldn't be thinking, that's a go, that's a green light all the way. I have learned that nothing is by my power, nor by my strength, but that everything is by the Spirit of the Lord. Listen, God knows what you need. He also knows what you want. Those things will not come according to your timing. Those things will come to you according to his will. And that is it. So if it's good or bad, whatever your circumstances is right now, and you're waiting for God to move, 
this is a very critical point in your life. This is a great, very critical point in your, in your walk with God. This is time for you to know that you serve a holy and sovereign God. This is also time for you to be in prayer about what you can learn through your waiting, what you can, what you can learn from it, but also what you can learn about God through this. And get, asking him to give you peace and comfort through what you are going through. And then thirdly, this is a time where you learn to trust him more. Because while you're waiting, you don't understand what's going to happen. You don't understand where you're going to go. You don't see it. But you serve a God who said, I will be with you. I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. As Christians, we need to take a lesson from this passage. And we need to understand that all things are in God's hands. We need to be creatures that understand that God is sovereign. If he says wait, then wait. If he says go, then go. I don't know about you, but it's become pretty clear as to the things I should wait on and the things that we should pursue. At least the conviction that I have from the Lord. Now, do I grab those things and I, do I, do I cl cloud, you know, cloud the waters on it? Yes, of course I do. And, and so do you. That's where our issue is. But as we wait, we're not waiting because we're being lazy. We shouldn't be. We're not waiting because we're scared. We're not waiting because the cost is too much. We're waiting because we want to ensure that we're walking by the spirit and not by the flesh. Praise God that we serve a God who knows all things, who has determined all things, and whose will will come true no matter what. Let's pray.